Welcome back to Adobe Live on this Monday morning slash afternoon because for you, Sophie, who's joining me today, I know it's quite early, isn't it? How are you? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. We've just come back from off. If you have missed that, by the way, do check out all the replays that are available on Behance. Uh, we have, I think over like 30 different artists and uh, designers joining us during the off streams. So unfortunately, it's already over. It went by just like that. But we have tons and tons of replays with uh, inspiring artists from photographers to designers to uh, motion designers to uh, even one musician, which was very fascinating to me. And of course, tons and tons of portfolio reviews. Um, and yeah. Today, however, we're back to our regular scheduled programming here in Adobe Live. And like I said, I'm joined by Sophie, who is a photographer. And um, I think perhaps, Sophie, for those people who don't know you, who haven't seen the previous streams with, with you, um, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about you? Let us know who are you? And perhaps we'll also take a look at the uh, website you've prepared. Yes, I would love to. I'm Sophie. Um, I'm happy to be here with all of you guys. I'm originally from Germany and I live in New York City now and I'm a freelance photographer. Um, and I mostly shoot people, fashion and commercial beauty stuff. Um, and yeah, I mean, you'll see that on my website. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yep, we're already live um, and just, I need my yes. camera, there we go. Okay, so we're looking at your camera right now, uh, at your camera, at your website right now. Um, yeah. And it's just sophiekeatsman.com. So I will also put that link exactly. into the chat in just a moment. By the way, yeah, ooh, if you want to have a look. Ooh. almost <laughs> forgot we have a chat. <laughs> so, uh, people God, can you join. scared me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, no, no. It was all, all good, all good. I just had a look at chat, and of course, Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I can see a lot of people in the chat already. I can see. Let's have a look. Uh, I have Gareth and Gelana and Jan and Kirsty and Linda and Mohammed and Oliver and Sandrine and Sean and Stefan and Vikram and Tim. Who? Oh my God. <laughs> who's Tim? That's very strange. Um, and if you didn't hear your name right now, then you haven't joined the Behance chat. So do come on over to be.net slash Adobe Live. Join us in the chat. Say hi. And... Um, We'd love to uh, chat to you. I would just put the link on stream. There we go. And um, now, back to you. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting. <laughs> I'm just, just scrolling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't mind me. Just scrolling through while you're talking. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, these are all great photos. And I My think own we've, <laughs> we, I think we've seen already some of them also in the previous stream you did. So um, some of those might be familiar, others I think could also be new. So um, what's, uh, what's like the idea behind all those photos? I, we can see lots and lots of unique uh, people and uh, what was the inspiration behind all those uh, photos? So I studied photography in Berlin and then shortly after I graduated, I moved to New York City. and. Um, when I moved here, I realized there was a lot of people that aren't visually represented enough in our media, in, you know, commercials and advertisements these days. Um, and there was so many inspiring people that I met went here when I met, when I moved into the city and I just, you know, I already had the technical skills. And so I started shooting those people because I, you know, kind of sort of had my foot in the door in the commercial photography industry. And I wanted to give these people access to that. And I wanted to see them on billboards and commercials and, um, 
give them a space to be visually represented, whether that's mm -hmm. about body positivity, people with disabilities, people from the LGBTQ community, just people with unique stories and um, yeah, people that are underrepresented. So that's my main focus usually. Right, right. And of course, um, like uh, also on Adobe Stock, which um, I'm always looking at, we also um, see much in uh, like many more uh, people with uh, diverse backgrounds. And of course, um, that's something that's really, really important to the Adobe Stock team to highlight um, all photos, uh, no matter uh, gender, orientation, skin color, body form, whatever. Um, yeah. So, uh, really important project, certainly, and I think um, everyone in the chat, Linda, like Linda saying, I like the different personalities, exactly. So, um, okay. yeah, lots of positivity, and um, today I think you have also brought a photo from one of your shoots earlier this year with you, and I think we're going to edit that, yeah. is that right? From this shoot. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, hang on. Okay, there you go. Okay. By the way, for those people who don't know... We'll just uh, do one picture today. Uh, Sophie is joining us uh, from all um, over the world. From I think you're from New York right now joining us? Yeah, I'm in New York City. Um, I hope <laughs> you guys can hear me okay. It's all right. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It's just oh, for a second you were frozen. It's all good. We can see and hear you yeah, just yeah, fine. Yeah. All right. So you brought um, yeah. a photo from this shoot. I think this one, this is it, right? Yes. All right. So um, let's right let's check out how it looked before you done, have done any uh, edits, perhaps. You can show us the before. There we go. So this right. is what I started with, pretty much. Obviously, there's already a little bit of color grading on this, but um, give you a little before and after. And maybe a little background story about this picture and about the person in the picture. Um, this is Jaza, and Jaza is a good friend of mine. And this was actually my third time shooting her. And Jaza it has a really unique story. She has a very rare skin condition called lamella ichthyosis or ichthyosis. I don't really know how to pronounce it, but um, basically, what that means is that her skin peels off and renews itself like every couple of weeks and she's had this since birth and obviously gives her a very unique look um but it's also you know created an amazing character a lot of resilience in who she is and she always had this dream of being a model and um yeah pretty much paved her own way in the industry because nobody like her had ever been you know represented in commercial photography and commercial modeling and she's doing amazing she's doing campaigns for target and i don't know what else she's done but she's done a lot um over the last like two three years that she really jumped into this um and it's always a pleasure working with her and um yeah obviously she has you know very unique skin so there's a little bit of a unique approach to how i retouch it as well um and yeah i'd love to show you guys yeah and i, f I feel like this um is also really important that we are uh, i guess you are retouching i'm not doing anything i'm just watching um but we are today of course we're retouching this image but this doesn't mean that we will take away any of this um condition the skin condition Quite exactly. the opposite. It will be. Uh, it will stay yeah. there exactly <laughs> as it is. We're just focusing on other distracting elements that uh, take away from the otherwise really cool image. Yes, so exactly. Yeah. Sometimes you get this like uh, for um, skin retouching, you remove every last imperfection, and this is definitely not um, what's happening today. No, absolutely, and I think that's why this is such an interesting image to demonstrate on as well, because obviously it is a beauty image, um, mm -hmm. but I think ethical retouching is so important and. Um, there's so many elements to skin that oftentimes just kind of get washed out in commercial photography, um, which is really a shame because it, it shows so much character and obviously, you know, hers is a very unique example, but I'll show you guys exactly how I approach it. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna... All right. Let's, let's get started. I'm excited. 
the, the scariest Delete moment. Deleting <laughs> everything. <laughs> ah, no, have you saved? Annika. I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure Annika should have said in the chat, please save. Oh, she didn't. Oh, well. That's what happens. All right. Too bad. Well, I'm going to recreate it for you guys now. <laughs> Let me just All right, take let's, off let's one ring. You know, I guess when you wear a ring on your thumb and then you're trying to hold your pen, and you're like, this is annoying. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so all my rings, I always, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I always start off with a pre-programmed um, action that I have in here. I have to admit, I didn't pre, I didn't program this myself. Um, the retoucher that I work with a lot um, programmed this for us, so that sometimes we tag team on some photos, so that we're both working in the same layout. Um, and basically, all of this is there's. This doesn't add anything to the image. This just sets us up kind of in our layers here. Um, and it does already add the grain. So the first thing I always do is I take off the grain because I like to retouch without it on because sometimes it helps you see, yeah. you know, imperfections or splotchiness a little bit better. And then I usually just work down here. Um, this is more her territory up here. I do more like local color grading. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, I like to give myself at least two layers to begin with. Um, and in general, when I'm retouching Jaza, I think it's important that, you know, you talk to your model if you're going to be the one that's going to be doing the retouching. And since I've worked with her a couple of times now, I know that um, obviously we don't want to take away from her skin condition. We want to keep this pattern. We want to, you know, highlight her beautiful skin. Um, but what she did say is that, you know, her skin gets very dry and when we're shooting, she's usually reapplying moisture throughout the shoot. And I like to give her a lot of time to do that as well. Um, but what she did say was okay to take away was these little flaky bits of skin because mm -hmm. those are not always there. It just depends on how moisturized her skin is. Yeah. So those are little elements that, you know, they're not permanent. Um, they are part of her skin condition, but she said it was all right to take those out because she's always trying to avoid that in general when we're yeah. shooting. So I like to kind of, you know, when I don't know the first time we shot together, I, I actually asked her, I was like, do you want me to leave those in? Because if she did, I totally would have. Um, but she said, not necessary. All right. um, and for those of, um, them, of, of the people joining at home and um, watching and perhaps also retouching along, who knows, um, you are using <laughs> the... You're using the um, spot healing brush, I believe, right? Yes, exactly. I mean, this might not be the most exciting for you guys, but I always like to start with the thing that like catches my eye the most when I start, but you know, retouching an image, and this just stands out to me. So I like to just like roughly go in and like take care of some of the like major bits because I'll be looking at it for a while. Um, Sometimes it's nice to just go in and like satisfy your eye, I would say. It makes the process a little bit more pleasurable. Um, so I won't bore you guys with this too much. <laughs> no, it's but... okay. That, we're, we're here to watch. It's all good. Okay. <laughs> and Kirsty's also saying editing an image while listening. There we go. I love that. A bit of collaborative editing. Maybe I should this. try that sometime. What do you guys usually listen to besides live streams when you're retouching? Because I know I always need a roster of entertainment. Sometimes it's, you know, very calming music to keep me focused. Sometimes it's an audiobook. Sometimes I have to rewatch a show I've seen a thousand times in the background if I know I'm going to be sitting all day. <laughs> Yeah, Whatever often when I, going, right? at least for me, <laughs> I'm curious what the chat will say. So at home, what are you listening to? Or are you listening to anything while you work? Um, when I really have to focus, I usually just have some very quiet ambient uh, music going on the background. But if it's more like um, routine work that I know how it works and I just need to do it, um, then sometimes a stream or two pass or um, some <laughs> some podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> and Sean, oh dear, Sean is working in After Effects, Media Encoder, Arrow, I think, Photoshop, Illustrator, and Character Animator, right now, apparently. 
<laughs> so, and this live stream is not distracting at all. <laughs> no, I, I feel like he was getting bored. Like, oh, yes, I have 20 apps <laughs> open. I think I need another one. Hang on. Let me let me grab I my phone. There you. we go. Oh, yes, another stream, please. <laughs> Some people are true multitaskers. <laughs> oh, dear. I couldn't do it. Um, and Sandrine says, I listen to the radio or maybe a podcast. I prefer music as I don't need to concentrate as much. Well, that's good. Um, and uh, Kirsty says, uh, she's working in Lightroom Classic at the moment. And Sebastian says, lounge music or soundtracks and scores. Oh, yes, some g a good movie soundtrack. Makes you feel like you're doing exceptional work while you're just renaming that's folders. I'm renaming folders. It's like, look at me. Sometimes you gotta dramatize your life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> look at me. I'm doing it, work. For me, sometimes it's the Disney soundtrack studios. I've ever listened to those. Very cheesy, but they satisfy <laughs> the little kid in me sometimes. Uh, you know. <laughs> I will retouch the world. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay, Premier so Pro. Premier I've taken Pro. care of like the rough elements here. I would say. Mm. Yep, sorry, going back to the image for just a moment. <laughs> All right. What are you working on? Back Let's to the... Talk to, talk to us about that. Put on a little curve here. Um, just because I think the image is still looking a little bit flat, um, especially because Jayza is black. Um, I like to... Do this weird shape of a curve sometimes. The S curve? Or to S bring out the. So it's an S curve, but I put in a little step up here, which is um, yeah. mainly for the highlights because I think it um, it works best yeah. on black skin. Because um, otherwise, sometimes it just gets too contrasty, or it gets like the highlights. The highlights are too rough then it washes out the complexion on um people of color the most for white people i usually mm. don't need this um but as you can see like it brings out the luminosity in her skin a lot um obviously this is like extreme now so then i'll probably go in and like see how much i want it sometimes i'll put up i'll pull up some of my other work on the side or I'll just like have my website up on the side and I can kind of like eyeball it so that I have it at the same kind of degree of um, contrast and luminosity. Cause like, this is too much, I think. Yeah. But let's see. <laughs> You're like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, that's actually a really, really good point because um, when I'm also retouching or working on images and applying effects, often, especially if you're using uh, adjustment layers where it's super easy, you can just go back and dial down the opacity just a bit. Exactly, yeah. Think, like, and yeah. It's also yeah, always okay. good to like see what you've done and then yeah. and then like tune in, you know? Because otherwise you lose reference to where you are at. Or even if you just... And I always it, collapse my layers too. Even if you just, just look at it too long, <laughs> you just tend to not notice anything. And just when you look away and come back the next day, it's like, what have I done? Exactly. Oh. So I like to like work on the contrast and the color and, you know, like a, a curve here um, overall. But then what I also do is I look at different sections of her body and I kind of assess the colors overall. So like here, for example, I really like the color and the contrast of her skin versus here, for mm. example, I think her arm is a little bit too yellow. I think her elbow looks a little bit too gray, which is also, you know, due to dry skin, but it's often also due to light. Like, for example, there's a little bit of color, I think, missing here in the neck, like wherever the shadows fall, sometimes you lose color. Um, and I think her face could be a little bit, um, I think her complexion could be a little bit more contrasty here. So I think I spend a lot of time doing this on my images where I assess different parts of the skin, just because, you know, the camera will catch the colors mm. differently in different sections. And if you take your time to kind of go in and correct some of those things, it really makes a big difference, I always find. 
And I just use my memory of what her complexion is, what her skin tone is, and what the um, like underlying tones in her skin are. You know, some people like some people have more olive tone skin. Others have a lot of yellow in their skin. Others have a lot more magenta. So uh, I think it's important that you pay attention to that when the person is in front of you. Um, so, I've even been on some commercial jobs where the the retoucher that will be doing the retouching for the campaign will be on set with us um, just so she has seen the model in person because she's the one that's going to have to assess it um, yeah. in the end. You know, I think people should do that more often. <laughs> because I was about to ask you, like, how do you know that this one is too, this arm is too yellow or this one is too gray? But, no, but you say that you actually just pay attention during the shoot it makes of course makes a lot of sense now um and i suppose after lots and lots of editing different portfolios you just get an eye for it and you just tend to see like oh no Absolutely, this was yeah. slightly different and this needs to be there um yeah just going um back to the uh, mm -hmm. color editing you did so first you selected the area you want to edit with a selection yes. tool, then you feather the area so you don't get any hard mm -hmm. uh, edges. And then you used, um, I think, color balance, was it, to uh, take out the yes. uh, quote unquote exactly. wrong color? So I do it a little backwards. I think a lot of people, they put on an adjustment layer, make the adjustment, and then brush in the adjustment yeah. <laughs> by going here and using white and black brushes. I do, I've always done it this way where I grab the lasso, I grab the area that I want to work on. Yeah, I'll just walk you through it one more time. Mm -hmm. I grab the area I want to work on. For example, here, her elbow, I think is too gray. I feather it roughly and I kind of just assess, okay, how large of the portion of the image am I grabbing? And I roughly know, you know, these numbers kind of like how much I want to feather it. And then I go in and I hit my adjustment layer, which basically does the same thing. But what I like about this is that I already know exactly which area I grab. So now if I make an adjustment, I am just looking at that in mm -hmm. at that portion of the image. Um, entire image. And then if I want to kind of fine tune my adjustment, then I go in with my brush and I, you know, will overlap the like the edges a little bit more so like now this area i made more i gave it um, more saturation mm -hmm. and then i usually see okay is there any other areas in this image where i want to do the same i grab my white brush and you know depending on where i want to be at like for example here i think her you tend to looks use a little gray. You tend to use saturation over vibrance. I I think it yeah it depends. I like I like just using the saturation sometimes and then going in and like adjusting certain areas with the curve. I that's yeah. always how I've done it. Um, because sometimes you know because the reason why I'm asking is just um, there's a difference between vibrance and saturation where vibrance usually tends to saturate the non uh, already saturated colors first and doesn't oversaturate any so that can be useful for skin retouching and it also tries to yeah. protect skin tones uh, intelligently yeah so sometimes uh, you might want to use saturation other times vibrance it is might be friend. a good option too yeah and the cool thing about the um, saturation and vibrance adjustment layers uh, you have both sliders on one they it has um, vibrance and saturation so you can always pick and choose which one you like um, yeah but yeah uh, of course this one also work works just as fine as well and um, I also like the uh, way you did the um, selection so you selected all the areas first and then made the color adjustments which um, for me sounds like a good idea because it stops you from just uh, painting it everywhere like oh i paint this here this looks great let me paint it on a bit more and more and more and then suddenly you have the entire image yeah. uh, uh, selected it's like ah, okay and this way i guess you yeah can... and then you lose reference of where you started exactly. you might go overboard mm -hmm. i mean of course there is a way for you to um bring back the um the mask and see it uh yeah on the image by holding an option and clicking on the mask so that way you can see what you have painted. But, you know, this 
it's a nice workflow. I also like this. All right, so yeah. we're now um, at the... I'm using the clone stamp um, just to get rid of some of her flyaways here. Um, clone stamp. Oh, wow. I haven't seen that one in a while. <laughs> but yeah, I suppose yeah. because of the um, very neutral and soft background, you don't really need to uh, worry about textures and protecting any textures, so you should be fine. Nope, exactly. Yeah. And I like to start with a big brush, make it easy on myself. And then the closer I get to the hairline, the finer I make my brush. Mm -hmm. And usually just try to pick, you know, and one strand of hair. What I've also found very useful is um, a trick I've learned from Terry White. Um, he uh, often uh, reduces flyaway hair by uh, using the liquify tool, of all things. And just pushing it gently over so you don't get like a super sharp corner um, but you also uh, have a bit of uh, just a tiny bit of flyaway hair but like really squished yeah. down and i think a combination oh, of a um, re of um, cloning and uh, squishing the hair could perhaps be the solution <laughs> yeah. for a lot of problems squish, it, squish the flyaway <laughs> just squish it down just squish them onto the head <laughs> just add some water and <laughs> okay um <laughs> I have uh, a comment, or well, question, uh -huh. no, it's a comment, uh, from Sandrine, a very helpful one. She says, one of the things I find useful is that when you're not sure, put a top uh, contrasty curve layer, and if something is too visible in the retouch, when you boost the contrast overall, that means it needs to be toned down. So essentially what Sandrine is talking about is uh, check layers, layers that help you to see um, uh, things that otherwise you wouldn't would, couldn't see like sometimes yeah. dust particles other times color by removing the color it helps you to see how bright something is if you just turn it to black and white yeah. um so yeah definitely a good idea check layers really really important I like that kind of take it into the extreme just to help your eye along mm -hmm. just like to that. make sure that sometimes you know it's a classic like sensor spots on your camera if you haven't cleaned your sensor properly, sometimes you tend yeah. to miss these. And I think there are some, um, I think Lightroom even has like an option to visualize um, those. But I could be wrong now. I Which I'm opened. certainly guilty of that too. I have <laughs> Lightroom in ages. Um, and also Oliver yeah. says, I, he does that all the time, coming back the next day and saying, oh my God, what have I done? Reset. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's all about training your eye too. And like, um, I've learned to use a lot of references of previous images I've done also when it comes, especially when it comes to color. Sometimes you think you're killing it and then you throw it up on your website or something and see it next to another image that you've previously done. And you're like, oh, Oops. oh no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, how do you make sure, like if you have um, more than one, um version of the portrait or if you have more than one photo um, like it's like a series of um, shots of the same model but in different poses perhaps how do you mm -hmm. make sure that they all look consistent so that one doesn't look too yellow compared to the other one do you compare them to next to one another do, do you put them do you print them out or i usually lay them next to each other um when i put my like overall color curve on it like this one I shot with daylight, so there can sometimes be a lot of variation in that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just kind of like put them all next to each other and do like a rough kind of matching, um, which I do before I go into Photoshop. And then, um, for example, once I'm working on one image, I'll pull up the previous image that I've done before. I'll just kind of here go like this, lay them next to each other and just kind of have the other image in the corner here to kind of help myself compare them right 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 so kind of um liquefy this little bump down a little bit so that it's rounder oh yeah and i think the yellows for me are a little bit too much still in her skin um remembering and that's actually a good um, thing and to talk about for just a second. Using the hue saturation, you can't just adjust the colors globally. You can also um, 
pick and choose the different um, color yeah. subcategories, like the yellows, so or like, even okay, the yellows are too much for me. And the cool thing about that is, if you actually make the panel a bit bigger, like right now it's unfortunately hidden. Perhaps you can show that. So just open, click on the hue saturation panel for a moment, and actually make it bigger like by um, adding more vertical. Um, like just make the panel a bit bigger at the um, bottom. You oh, can. There we go. And if you select any of the colors, like the uh, yellows, for example, you can actually see um, how the effect. And you can oh, you also drag it range. around, um, so you can mm -hmm. modify the way uh, the yellows work. So um, you also can drag it any way you want. You don't have to use the yellows, even though it says yellows. Um, you don't have to use it. And yeah. a great way to see what it's selecting is like you can just increase the saturation to 100%, and then you see which colors are affected. Or perhaps just uh, like uh, change the hue completely. <laughs> yeah. That's and then you can see like, oh yeah. Right. See that? Okay, there we go. Now you know which ones are selected. And now you can really go in and dial in. See like, oh, I don't want the uh, the pink background, the floor, the or backdrop. maybe her clothes. Yeah. I just want the skin. So you can really get in there and target everything yeah. you want. And yeah. there also mm -hmm. is... Um, a way I think to in um, if you go if you select colors in Photoshop um, via select color range, there's also a skin uh, tone option in there. So you can by default select skin tones automatically, and this can also be a way to um, only target the skin tones you want. Yeah, I think yeah we can leave Very the image useful. like that. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she, she will enjoy it's that one. Gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, she has she has um, this glow to her. I can't describe it. <laughs> oh dear. I play around with my curves a lot until yeah. I find that. And another cool thing with curves okay. is um, you can also set a blend mode to those curves. For example, you often have the issue that if you darken. Uh, uh, the colors using curves, you often tend to introduce saturation. Perhaps you don't want that. Um, and the way to get rid of the saturation would be to set the blend mode to luminosity. And then you can make it darker or brighter, doesn't matter. Uh, but you won't affect the uh, saturation. And luminosity is at the very bottom. There you go. Luminosity. So if you go back like before and after. Well, too late now. <laughs> but no, I meant uh, before and after between luminosity and normal. Oh, but it doesn't matter. It's okay. <laughs> normal. Luminosity. I actually like... Depends on what you prefer. Of course, if you w yeah. if you like this extra, li tiny extra saturation boost, then yeah, by all means, use normal. That's fine. But yeah. sometimes it's good to know that there's an option to not have it. Absolutely, yeah. Right. Definitely always trying to make the skin look uh -oh. so, oh. the kind of just, you know, how the human eye would see it and, okay. and also just very even in color. So I like that. I'm going to take out this wrinkle down here. Um, just because it's annoying. <laughs> no, I don't need it. And also, guys, like I'm completely self-taught. Like um, I never, you know, there's. I'm sure there's a lot of things that I do that there's a something that would make it a lot faster, a lot more efficient, you know. But I, mean... I started using Photoshop. Like I started in Photoshop Elements when I was in. I must have been like 12 or 13 because we had a class in school. So I've been doing this for years and I always learn a lot from the retoucher that I work with. And she actually went to school for this. But yeah, like a lot of things. Yeah, maybe they're not they're not 100 percent efficient. So I just okay. kind of like figure out my own way of like how I like to see my work and how I get like what tools get me to that degree, you know. But if it works, who cares? Nobody at the end exactly. would say like, oh, I can see you haven't used this selection technique to achieve your effect and it doesn't look good. No, of course not. <laughs> People don't care exactly. about that. But OK, maybe yeah. I do, but I'm weird. So <laughs> I mean, obviously, time is always a factor. Like, right. 
I try to make things not slower than they need to be, but um, I also learned that like I used to be a perfectionist about things and I realized that, you know, the overall impression of the image is key and, you know, going back and forth, zooming in and out of like the little details that you've worked on um, kind of helps you save a lot of time when you're like, does this need to be perfect? <laughs> also knowing what platform you're going to be on, like then you can assess kind of what scale your image is going to be at, you know, like if it's a campaign, I work yeah. at a hundred percent, you know, but if I know it's just for social media, I might save myself a little bit of time and not do that, you know? Right. Um, so, and while you were yeah. painting away using the clone stamp tool, by the way, um, <laughs> I just wanted to say that you could have also perhaps used just the normal brush tool because this is often an underrated way to um, quickly bring in some color yeah. and perhaps use like the brush tool using a reduced opacity to just reduce the effects can often be yeah. a great way and since you I like a little bit of this marble though so okay. that's why i didn't sure. do that but that's true like i used to be so hesitant to just use a brush and paint on my image because i was like no that's not real photography then then you're painting but your photograph can be your painting and sometimes yeah. it doesn't matter right and at the Save end yourself some time at the end i think you uh, had the grain on top of it so you will still have some I was texture. just about i was literally just about to put this back in which like <laughs> You know, sometimes, if, especially with backgrounds, if you are working on those and there's a little bit of splotchiness, the grain will kind of. Can you bring it to 100%? <laughs> can you bring it to 100% so we can see the grain? Because otherwise, I think it will be too compressed too much on stream. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know if you guys can I see that. I don't think that's coming through grain. too well. Uh -huh. I mean, of course, we we are streaming over the internet and to reduce yeah. data, we have to do some compression. I can see it on my end. <laughs> I, I, we, we will all trust you that you can I see it. I promise it's there. <laughs> it's there. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, this image already has a lot of grain because right. I was shooting in a, with very limited light. So I, my ISO was pretty high for this shoot anyways. Um, and by the way, you're, Another you're not, not alone by uh, using te techniques you've picked up on your own. Uh, Kirsty says, I've also taught myself Photoshop, but I watched videos on how Photoshop works, but it just came down to uh, playing with it. And that's right. And uh, the University of YouTube. <laughs> yes. Exactly. It's a toolbox and you're yeah. allowed to use your toolbox in the way that works best for you, right? That's what makes it fun, too. Exactly. So sorry, you wanted to, you and were, it's your art, so <laughs> you were about to say something, sorry. No, you're all good. Um, yes, so I'm another thing I do on Jaza, she is wearing a little bit of eyeliner, but sometimes when her skin is flaking, it gets caught in her eyelashes and um it makes them lighter than you know when they're freshly painted with mm -hmm. mascara. So I go in and I um, I enhance, I darken her lash line a little bit just because I think it really brings out her eyes. Um, and I like to enhance the makeup a little bit that way. And again, I do this in a not very efficient way, but who cares? <laughs> You know, just wing it. Literally, because <laughs> it's an eyeliner. Anyways, um, Stephen has an interesting question. Talking yes. uh, talking about skin tones with a colorized neural filter. I'm not sure if you have tried that one before. It, it allows you like to um, convert black and white images into color I images. Think I have. No, I never have. It's really, really cool. If you have like a lot of old photos that are black and white and you want to colorize them, the neural filter can uh, really help with that and just give you... Oh, that's so interesting. Um, but the question like was, um, can you tell it that, that a person has particular skin tone without impacting other, other colors and skin tones? I've seen photos of uh, black people colorized by the filter with Caucasian skin tone. Um, yes, you can certainly add spot color. So you can say like, ooh, this particular color right here should be darker uh, skin tone, perhaps. Or maybe if it's 
clothing like this one should be blue. That's definitely an option. You can sort of like give it some hints. The neural filter, like oh, this one should be that color, that one should be this color, because at the end of the day, it's a black and white image, and um, the f the filter doesn't really know is it a, does the person really have darker skin or is it perhaps just the lighting? It's often very tricky to figure out um, how uh, skin tones and as a matter of fact, all colors in black and white work because the neural filter has to guess. Yeah. It just takes a wild guess, spins the wheel of color, and just says. <laughs> Ah, uh -huh, that one. So yes, it's possible, and yes, sometimes it needs a bit of help. Right. We have about Hi. 20 minutes. Uh, so I, can you guys see that eyeliner? Oh, yes, um, it does make a difference. See how it like, you know, it, it like draws your eye towards her eyes. Um, and it gives her, it enhances the shape of her eyes, which her eye shape is so beautiful. And, you know, she did put on an eyeliner. I usually don't add makeup where there was no makeup, yeah. um, but I certainly enhance it if it was there. And then yeah. I usually go in and I just sharpen just the highlights in the eyes. Um, and as you can see, my focus here wasn't perfect, which don't come for me, but... Um, <laughs> I'm going to sharpen a little bit around her eyes, too. Yeah. Like um, I said, it was a super dark room, unfortunately, that we were shooting in. Well, first of all, um, the um, the retouching, retouching you did to the eyes, before you did it, I was like, is it really going to make that much of a difference? But after you showed the before and after, I was like, yep, yeah. it does. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, it does. And now my question would be, do you um, go in and brighten the eyes, like the white in the eyes, or do you usually leave that alone? You know what? I usually don't. Um, I've done a lot of commercial retouching jobs where they always ask for it. Mm -hmm. I tend to not do that because I think, I mean, maybe I could, but I never really feel the need to. If anything, yeah. I just sharpen the eyes. Right. And you don't want to have like these almost glowing eyes that are pure yeah. white and it looks just very weird. Like, okay, great. You found the yeah. brush tool. If you do that, right. be like really, really subtle about it. Yeah. I would say. Another thing that's catching my eye is her manicure, especially on a beauty shot like this, where like her, obviously her hand is very much um, a key element here. So I like to see perfect nails <laughs> one thing if, if there's one thing i've learned from you know the like commercial photo industry it's just like the little details that you know people get so perfectionistic about make a difference when people see your work especially if it's you know i'm always trying to build my commercial portfolio so like even though this was a private shoot i'm thinking okay what kind of client could i maybe attract with this and um Sometimes I like to be extra, like, perfectionistic about it. But again, like, you know, I had to really stop myself there, too, because I would do this for every image. And then I would realize these are just for Instagram. What are you doing? You know? <laughs> no, but um, okay. saying just for Instagram, I really think that uh, you can't really say that uh, nowadays anymore because I've no, you can't. I know that there are lots and lots of <laughs> artists who got most, if not all, of their work through uh, Instagram and, of course, other social media, right? Um, yeah, and that's true. And like most of the work I do, yes, it will go on my Instagram, but it will definitely go on my website, and eventually it'll, you know, maybe go on my agency's website or something, or it'll it'll land in a deck that for a pitch for a client or something like that. So yeah. You never point. know who's watching. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you have the skill, you know, like. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I also don't like that her nails are a little bit too thick, so I'm going to thin them down a little bit. You know, when people get like a gel manicure and they make them really thick. Right, right. Well, <laughs> You're like, I'm, I'm of course, I mean, I, I, I know <laughs> that I do it every day and I, I'm really particular about it. I don't want my nails to be too thick. I don't like that. <laughs> um, but uh, one question was, um, also, by the way, uh, Sandrine says, always check nails, faults, eyelashes, if any, dry lips. Yes. 
Yes, exactly. Dry lips, totally. Cuticles. <laughs> and um, do you, like, what's your opinion on uh, removing or reducing wrinkles, like around the eyes or in this case, perhaps around the mouth? Do you usually reduce? Do you remove or do you leave them alone? Do you have, like, um, mm. some quote-unquote rules about that? Um, I think that's a really good question because obviously, especially in the beauty industry, we've set really toxic standards. Um, there's a lot of anti-ageism going on. Um, the degree at which I we touch usually depends on the client, who the image is for. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like um, that is a key factor to the degree of retouching so like if it's let's say it's for a beauty brand like a makeup product they like to go very perfectionistic with things but even then I think there's still a degree of what is realistic and what is unrealistic and making somebody look younger than they are I think is unethical um, mm. and it plays into that ageism but um let's say it's for foundation um i will definitely reduce more skin texture than i would on another image but i think when it comes to wrinkles um i would never take them out like for example eye wrinkles sometimes a client will ask for um brightening of the wrinkles so like you go in with the clone stamp and you set it to lighten and you kind of reduce the depth of the wrinkles um but even with that I would be really careful um because if you do it too much again you're just aging somebody backwards which I think is not ethical but sometimes like a makeup product will settle in the wrinkles and then you know if it's a beauty campaign or something they'll ask you to take that out and in that case I would um I think it, it's it's a tricky answer, I would say. Um, there's I think there's a certain boundary which I wouldn't cross. And at that point, I would push back um, against whoever is asking for certain adjustments or just kind of point out that that would alter the integrity of the talent um, and then hopefully find a common ground there. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah. And this one is, again, a very tricky subject because at the end of the day, they are your client and they are paying to do you to do a thing. But also, yes. they are your client and clients can be fired too. Well, and hopefully, you know, like they would be coming to you. Okay, to be fair, with the biggest, like the bigger campaigns that I shoot, I'm not the one doing the retouching my retoucher is, but I always try to be the middleman there. Oftentimes, like mm. clients, they want to just work directly with the retoucher because obviously that saves time. But that way you're giving up a lot of um, control over the end product of your image. But for example, my retoucher is very ethical about the way she retouches. She founded a platform called The Post Co, um, which is about ethical retouching and post-production transparency because so many people you know we consume what like I think it's like a crazy average of like 50,000 images a day or something just by being wow. on our phones and on the internet or something um and you know the average person that isn't in this world they have no idea what we do in retouching we she is still trying to every retouch, which they are a little bit. So oh, yeah. I think it's cool that, like, for example, watch a live stream like this. Sorry, I think I think we're having some issues, some slight issues. I think you are. Can you say me? Oh no. No? Yeah, okay. can you I hear me? Back. Okay, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I think, guys. <laughs> I think you just need to uh, say the thing you did for the last 30 seconds. Just say that again. Um, sorry. <laughs> sorry, guys. The the pond in between us got a little too big there yeah, for a yeah, second. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I was saying. Mm, we were talking about um, uh, if, if you always have to do what the client wants and um, that you can also fire yeah. a client sometimes if they just yes just and, doesn't work and yeah and I I try to establish myself where I not only provide quality I provide um, a certain stance I would say mm. on certain social issues um, which I think are reflected in my work. And I would hope that the commercial clients that I attract with my work are interested in giving me a voice in that. And I will always push for that. That doesn't mean that I don't sometimes find myself in rooms where I really have to advocate for certain things, mm. but I think it's always worth trying. And it's always great to have kind of a personal bottom line of like something that you won't do, a line that you won't cross. Um, because you're kind of looking at the bigger picture of like, socially, what are we teaching people? What are we saying is normal? And um, you as visual content creators hold a certain type of responsibility in that aspect. Like mm -hmm. I remember even in college, our professors would say that to us. They would be, you know, you're creating an image, you're creating a reflection of the world around you. And obviously that's your very unique perception but it does come with a responsibility towards people that aren't as visually literate. Um, and yeah, I think that's important definitely to kind of yeah, check yourself. <laughs> uh, and I think um, just like you said, hopefully the clients will see based on your portfolio, um, the way you retouch the photos, what they can expect also if they uh, come to you. So that's a quick, Absolutely. really good uh, thing. And Sandrine again says the most toxic thing going on is brands wanting retouches for plus size models and then asking you to make them slimmer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that is something that I would never do. I would totally put my foot down on that. Um, and that doesn't mean that on plus size models, we don't sometimes use the liquify tool. Because like a lot of the retouching is also, um, you know, like ill-fitting clothing and you basically like tailor the clothing in post-production. But there's a way of doing that gently and carefully without altering somebody's body shape, you know. Hmm. But you do have to have a certain amount of skill and a certain amount of thoughtfulness. I think that's always what it comes down to. Like I will always when I'm doing beauty skin retouching, I'll take it way too far um, and kind of make it, you know way too perfect and then i will go in and i will brush in a lot of imperfections again yeah. but like the degree to which you do it i think really shows your skill level of kind of thoughtfulness in your post-production process very yeah absolutely correct um we always have the saying like uh, reduce don't remove that's one yeah, thing exactly. you can do with uh, skin mm -hmm. uh, retouching uh, we have about seven minutes, so um, any last questions in the chat, do put them in. And in the meantime, I would also like to remind everyone who has perhaps just joined that first of all, we are streaming on Behance and we are also chatting on Behance. So if you're watching on YouTube, that's fine, but you're missing out. Join us over on Behance.net <laughs> slash live. That's where the chat is happening. And that's, uh, for example, where I can see some comments like, what I do is try to compromise and generally, generally retouch how the clothes fall onto the body more than just the body itself. Sometimes you just have to say no. Exactly. I think this is just what you said. And, um, oh, yes, okay, another thing. Yeah, and sometimes you can, like, oh, go for it. No, no, no. You, you continue. I was to talk, to talk about it something else. Just. Okay. Oh, I was going to say, you know, sometimes you can maybe come back to a client and be like, um, kind of try to reflect back to them the intention of their request for what asking you to retouch and make a kind of educated suggestion from a professional perspective and be like, may I suggest doing this instead? It will give you a similar effect without compromising the integrity of the talent or something like that and you know you can always try to lead people with love in a direction that is less toxic i would say 
exakt. Um, okay. I do have, and that's what I wanted to talk about. It's completely different and has nothing to do with your stream. That's why I wanted you to say your thing first. But we do have some exciting new things on Adobe Live this week. First of all, if you have missed the off uh, festival, I suppose, then uh, we have lots and lots of replays for you to watch. Um, they are all below the player. You can check them out. Adobe Live at off. We had a uh, great artist uh, doing um, just portfolio reviews, talking about their creative career and giving advice. And also, we will have a new stream later on this week on Friday, which is all about the new and cool Adobe Express or Adobe Creative Cloud Express, of course. So, a new stream from us this Friday. Check the schedule. It will be there uh, later today. Hopefully you will join us all at home. It's hopefully a bit more UK friendly time zones uh, because it's slightly early in the day. Um, it will be our first Creative Cloud Express stream this week. And I'm really excited. Um, right. Okay. Back to you for the final five minutes of the stream. I, at this point, I'm just tinkering. I'm very happy with the way we're looking, actually. All right. That's, that's also fine, because then I have a question like, how do you um, export and how do you save your work? Do you keep all the original files? Do you uh, crop them down or like, oh yeah, cropping in general. I don't think we have talked about that. Do you crop your images? I do crop my images, but I crop them not in Photoshop, which ah. um, th th I know that... Um, I'm working my way on to doing everything in Photoshop. Um, but right now I usually already have them cropped, mm -hmm. except for if I have to like extend the background or something, or I have to extend the dimensions of the photo. And then when I export, I usually don't save as Photoshop files. I save as TIFFs with layers um, and then we open them in Photoshop. Um, Okay. Which I don't know if it's bad to do it that way. Well, you know? <laughs> I wouldn't say it's bad, but of course, Photoshop <laughs> will make sure it's that if so you save bad. as a PSD, that you have the best compatibility. Um, I personally, I like PSDs, um, but TIFFs, yeah, that's fine. Whatever works. Yeah. Other I people... usually save as TIFFs, and then I. Um, have a preset in Adobe Bridge for web JPEGs that I usually just run my TIFFs through if I just want like a quick um, processing or I'll reopen it in Photoshop, save it as a large JPEG if I want to send like full JPEGs to clients or something. Yeah. Sean uh, <laughs> says, I like PSVs and I cannot lie. Mm-hmm. I see. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. <laughs> and Get that on a t-shirt. <laughs> Sandrine says, TIFFs may take a lot of space. Yes, um, of course. Uh, if you have large, uncompressed images, yeah, of course, they will take lots and lots of space. But yeah. you often need the quality because you really, if you want to get back into the images and edit something, you have it Absolutely. Has to be I was going to say the PSD is going to be just as much space, right? Well, essentially, there may be some different compression algorithm algorithms at work, but in theory, they should be similar in size. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Because the data yeah, has to be somewhere. Like, just, just yeah, I definitely always save the largest possible file and then get yourself a huge stack of these babies, oh, <laughs> unfortunately. Dear. The classic. <laughs> you know, yeah. You got it. And then always have a backup of your backup, too. And remember, people, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. backup doesn't mean you save it twice in a different folder. No. <laughs> do people do that? No, no. no. Who, who would do that? <laughs> we won't make you do show of hands, though. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if perhaps you also have like um, some sort of cloud storage, I know that Adobe also offers cloud storage. Um, where you can upload all your images, yeah. that can be a great option if you don't want to deal with um, any stacks and stacks of hard drives or yeah. networks. Or if your house servers. burns down. Yes. Which uh, having a backup in a remote location 
often overlooked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, if it's your job, definitely. Yeah. I mean, what, what would it cost you if you lost it? You know, so exactly. Don't don't find out. <laughs> Please don't find out. <laughs> anyway, I so, think yeah. we are about at time. So perhaps one last time. Can you maybe show us the uh, the before and after so we can see all the fantastic work you did today? All right, so this is where we started, and this is where we are right now. Yes, let me give you a little. And I really think that well you did really satisfying. <laughs> great job preserving the um, original nature of the image, but just removing all the distractions that would otherwise just be. I don't want to say unnecessary, but uh, yeah, just dis- distractions. That's what they are. Yeah, like little flyaways and stuff. You don't want your eye to go there first. You want to yeah, really. It, it doesn't really add anything to the image. People are looking. Exactly. All right. Well, then, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. It has been a pleasure watching you work and uh, you explaining your thought process. And I think we all got a glimpse into the inner workings of uh, Sophie's editing process. <laughs> uh, yes. right. Thank you and for having me, Tim. It was a lot of fun. And the chat also says, thanks, Sophie, and thank you. And Stephen says, my dad's that wife's son's fiance retouches all pictures of her to the point she doesn't look human anymore. Yeah, the classic uh, porcelain look, although yeah. that's also a style, so... If you want, if you like that, yeah, I mean, okay, fine <laughs> to do whatever you want. It's your Photoshop. Um, anyway, any thoughts? Oh, yeah, I think this is a good last question and then we will close out the stream. Any thoughts on dodging and burning or frequency separation? Um, so I actually don't really use frequency separation. I know that might be controversial, <gasps> um, but I do use dodge and burn a lot. Um, I don't know. Um, this image just happened to be one where I didn't use it, but yeah, mm. I dodge and burn quite a bit, especially on like beauty skin retouching. I do most of that in dodge and burn. Um, the number one thing I learned with dodge and burn is always perspective. Zoom out really far to see if you've created any blotchiness because <laughs> right, I've right. definitely done that zoomed in at 100% going at it for two hours and you zoom out and you're like <gasps> <laughs> especially if you lose like two if you use two layers one to lighten one to darken and you first you darken the area with one layer and then you lighten with the other and you end up at the same yeah. exact same spot you just you lose quality so yeah, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> definitely not hasn't happened to me before yeah certainly not not me <laughs> Right, um, that's it for the day. One more time, thank you very much for joining us. We will be back tomorrow with the next stream mm-hmm. all about uh, how to paint in fresco and improving your portfolio with Rachel and Karina. And on Wednesday, we will have another photography stream with Claire Laxton and I believe Joe is hosting that one. I think Still from Bangkok, as far as I know. Um, and on Friday, like I said, the new, the, the first time, uh, Creative Cloud Express, Adobe Express from the UK. But for now, thank you everyone for watching. I wish you a wonderful day and do join us in the WF Discord. The link is below the stream, as always. And any, any last words from you, Sophie? Just thank you to everybody in the chat and everybody that watched and yeah i hope you got to pick something up for yourself for your own progress all right thank you and see you soon everybody bye bye everybody